Um, so Tim is from the Donners, and uh, I think uh, fairly recently he started a new job. Um, you might want to talk about it uh, during. <laughs> okay, so then, uh, then ask him about it during break. <laughs> now, so during this talk, uh, Tim will tell us about web technologies. Uh, so Tim has spent a lot of time uh, f working on something that we mentioned earlier in this event as well, uh, a thing called Giraffe Tools. And sorry. You mentioned that. Yes, no, multiple times. It, it was a tool that was identified that helped someone visualize their pipeline. So, oh, well, well done. Yeah, I got that one. So, uh, so Tim will, uh, I originally approached Tim to talk about that, but then he said, let's make it a bit broader and, and speak about web, web technologies in neuroimaging uh, in the context of open science. And uh, thank you very much, Tim. And Tim has also been quite useful, uh, and not useful, helpful. <laughs> uh, well, useful as well, obviously. but. Uh, He's been, he's been a kind person in helping us uh, arrange uh, this event uh, and the previous one, so thank you very much. Cool. And thank you, Stefan. I appreciate it. So, um, Stefan already men mentioned it. Um, I, I was asked to talk about the, the uh, tools that I wrote. I was like, no, I like the, the bigger picture, the open science stuff, so I'm going to try to uh, give a lot of examples, and indeed, uh, the things I wrote uh, will briefly appear, but if I talk about it too long, then please just say next, you know? Um, web technologies in general is something I really like. The open science idea is something close to my heart. Uh, I suppose, so, uh, and web is, for me is a very important part of that. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, oh, sorry. F first, a quick question. These tags, does that ring a bell? What are they called? Tags. Tags, right. What is the language? Yeah, XML, HTML, I hear them both. All right, okay, so here and there, I'm going to try and probe you a little bit uh, because I don't really know what you know. Uh, anyway, so um, you start with the opening tag overview uh, and I'm going to talk, a well, why would you want to move to the web anyway? But the central question is, um, well, what I would really like to move towards is it really an end-to-end -end neuroimaging pipeline um, on the web, and the question here is going to be, can we do that? Uh, or is it, um, well, some years away, or is it never going to happen? Um, and clearly, is web the future? Uh, is something I would like to discuss with you. What do you think are the, uh, the, the main hurdles on the road? And then we end with a closing tag of the overview, which means next. First. Um, very recently, uh, only last year, there was a, a paper out for, from Anisha, uh, together with uh, JB, um, from the wet lab to the web lab. So I took a lot of inspiration from this. And if you want to know more, please read the paper. It's uh, really good. Um, so let's start. Why web? Why would you do it in the first place? Well, what I like about it is that it's just open by design. Uh, it is really taking the... Um, well, uh, reproducible practices as a principle and uh, is trying to, to communicate things uh, to the world um, and sort of implicitly, uh, if you know something is going to be open, uh, you, you immediately think about, um, well, how will it be perceived by others and um, you don't allow you to yourself to get away with sloppy coding. At least that, that's how it works for me. If I know that somebody else is watching over my shoulder, uh, I'll be a bit better uh, straight away. Oh, sorry. Um, so what, what Anisha and JB mentioned in the paper, they see it as critical for outreach and communication. Uh, I don't know how important you find that, but I do think there is some of a, a societal obligation, sorry, a scientific obligation to society uh, that, well, we should communicate our work uh, to others. Uh, and this is, uh, well, if you would do things natively on the web, uh, you, you've got that a lot quicker. Um, one of the things I feel is very important is that uh, it allows you to more easily collaborate with others. You are uh, 
very focused as a PhD or a postdoc or a scientist in general, uh, and there are only a few people in the world that do what you do. So if you do not, if you keep everything for yourself, um, and you find out later that uh, other people have done the same analysis, but in SPM or in FSL or just something you don't know, um, then it's a lot harder to to well. Uh, collaborate on that, uh, better find out early and communicate early. Um, and my general experience is that if you communicate and collaborate early, that is more valuable than keeping everything uh, for yourself as a, a single author thing, uh, because I can tell you, you're not going to make it by yourself in this world. Um, right, and... Um, in general, uh, more and more is happening on the web. Uh, the, the Googles and the Amazons of today are working to, towards cloud computing more and more. Um, so I think neuro imaging is moving towards that, uh, in that direction. So I would advise you uh, to, to hop on the boat as quickly as possible. And I, I put it in just to, to see if it will work out. Uh, if you live dangerously, you never have to bring a USB stick to your presentation, and then uh, still it goes wrong, and you've got to bring your entire laptop. Um, but the, the more general point is, uh, if presentations are on the web, uh, the information is accessible also after uh, the event, and with version control, you can even update it later on, anyway. Um, but I also want to um, point out some reasons why you would not do it, and uh, I want to point out these are not some, some straw man that I'm now going to, uh, well, uh, raise such that I can burn them down. These are legitimate concerns. There are legitimate concerns why you would not uh, do anything like that. And the, the first one is we are working with very sensitive data. So privacy and security is a big deal, and it's a real uh, big deal. So please be aware um, and, um, well, be mindful that that's always uh, dangerous. Um, at the moment, we are still always moving from our, our data on our desktop or on our server. Uh, and the communication with some platform in the cloud is still really difficult. Uh, and that hasn't been solved uh, yet. Um, yeah, that's to do with the fact that data is often living in several spaces. And every web platform, we'll get to that later, um, often has their own storage. And it's very difficult to connect these things. Uh, so there is no central space. Uh, yeah, right. Um, and thereby, um, Russ Baldrack mentioned uh, uh, previous OHBM, uh, every uh, PI that builds something cool, uh, well, sees that as their pet project with like the, the feather in their cap, um, was, uh, was his metaphor, um, which means they're only focused on that one thing and not on the integration uh, and, uh, of, of pipelines of, of different tools together, uh, which in the end, make sure that none of the tools are used. Well, sorry, that's a bit of an exaggeration. Um, but it, it's seriously hampering the use. Um, anyway, um, they're often, uh, yeah, it's often restricted by standardization. I'm very in favor of standardization because it's very useful to, you know, be interoperable uh, with, um, well, different data sets. The problem is that we as scientists really appreciate our own creativity uh, and our own fiddling with the data in a different way than already exists. Uh, so this might limit the things you can do with your, um, the, uh, with your data. Um, right, and um, often, especially with new things, it, it takes a while before you, uh, you can actually dive in there. Um, so it, it's requiring uh, a big time investment. Um, anyway, let's, let's move on. I do think you, you've heard the FAIR uh, principle during the last couple of days a couple of times, haven't you? FAIR, please. What is it? Findable, Findable accessible, interoperable and reusable. Well, the findable, clearly, the internet's public, so uh, that's very easy. Accessible, well, 
uh, is standardized as well because of just HTTP interoperable. Well, a browser is a browser and reusable. Well, that one isn't guaranteed automatically, um, even though the... Uh, but, but still, the web often, uh, the, the web tools often require some standardization that enforce reusability. Um, so, um, I'm going to talk a bit about um, neuroimaging in the cloud, so what you can use it for. Um, I'm going to, to name uh, many different examples. I tried to not always choose the, the most obvious ones. I hope to, to show you some uh, things that you haven't seen before. Um, what can you use web tools for? Well, uh, there is data collection, sharing, analysis, visualization, reporting. It's mainly these first three that in Anisha's paper uh, are mentioned, but uh, some of you in this room uh, actually uh, wrote some things for visualization or reporting, so I, I w wanted to add that to, to the list. But I also want to point out that this is a non-exhaustive list. Um, and I'm going to, to show uh, only some um, uh, tools that are out there. Um, so first, if you want to collect your data, if you really want to go end to end, uh, well, then you would need uh, data collection in the browser already. Well, uh, and that is the, the part for which I found fewest um, tools. Uh, I found something, uh, JS Psych. Has anybody ever heard of that? Please raise your hand. No, that's what I thought. So um, there are many tools out there, but they're hardly ever used. Uh, there are. Uh, this is a, a JavaScript um, library for uh, comp running an experiment completely in the browser. Uh, and the use case is pretty obvious. Uh, at the moment, you're inviting your students in. Oh, sorry, I I'm saying students because oftentimes we uh, just take psychology students, but just your um, your target audience in general. And this would allow you to, to do a mass experiment uh, with people at home, and then after that, later, the same experiment, uh, maybe with neuroimaging. Um, but one of the, the immediate problems that uh, is uh, sort of persistent uh, for many of these tools that I'm going to uh, name, JavaScript. Who has heard of JavaScript? Yeah who can write a little bit, a little bit of JavaScript. Oh, good. Who feels, yeah, they're comfortable? No, that's, that, exactly. It is really hard. Uh, it's not a, t a skill that we learn in, um, in ranging a lot. Uh, so uh, making a good web application in, uh, is really hard. Um, so most of these tools aren't um, created by, by neuroimaging experts. Um, or only by a very small subset, uh, which is which is very difficult uh, to to well to improve the tools um, because the well the iteration process is well not a closed loop of the the developers are not always also the users, um, whereas with field trip for example or Bitcoin. Um, the, the users are the developers and thereby uh, reiterate at a much faster pace. Um, so, and it, uh, this is clearly not as well tested as the, uh, the presentation in Psych Toolbox, as you know. Uh, one of the things I liked, uh, does anybody know Brenda? Yeah, yeah, yeah some of them. Uh, they're in the back, brilliant. Uh, Brenda, Tinder, but then for brains. No worries, there's no dating involved. Um, but uh, this is again for, from Anisha. Uh, she's very interested in the citizen science. What she did, uh, she had a lot of uh, images of poor quality, and she wanted to, to train machine learning uh, for, uh, well, automatically classifying good and bad image, but then you need a very large test data set. So what she did is let users, just anybody, rate uh, the quality in a Tinder-like way, uh, such that the result of this uh, was her test and training uh, data set. Um, and I felt it was a very creative way of using the web for, uh, for collecting data uh, that otherwise you would have taken it would have taken months to go to manually classify all, all the images. Right, let's move on. Um, so there is data sharing. I think most of you have heard of Open Neuro. Is that right? 
Yeah, a little bit, most of it. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to go through this one uh, pretty quickly. Um, for those who uh, he are here at the Donders, the, the Donders data sharing collection is pretty similar to Open Neuro. Um, <coughs> the idea is that you can store your data long term, um, excuse me, um, just on a server such that everybody can access it. It's related to a publication so people can download it. Uh, the privacy uh, and security settings are very well arranged. Um, often you have to. Um, deface uh, MRI images um, and uh, well the, the privileges of getting access as a reviewer or as an author or a contributor uh, that, that's uh, very well thought out. Um, it does require standardization though. Suppose um, I do MRI imaging but I'm interested in acquisition then uh, what I like to, to show is that from the DICOMs or from the even the, the raw case page data, you can uh, make very good uh, DICOMs or, uh, or, or nifty files. Um, and if I can only show defaced data um, on Open Neuro, well, then suddenly I can't open up my, um, uh, my data set anymore. That's not necessarily a problem. Uh, from Open Neuro and uh, Donder's data sharing collection, that's just in general a problem. Uh, I'm just saying um, standardization uh, captures probably 80 or 90 percent of the studies that we're doing, but definitely not all of them. Uh, so that's just a, a, a difficult, uh, like a balance that developers always have to, to think about. Uh, in the case of especially open neuro and preferably also the Donders, uh, the, the input is always in bits and the nifty uh, statistical maps are usually used as output. But maybe nifty is ne not necessarily the output of interest that you're generating and then it's a lot difficult, more, a lot more difficult to, to share because they don't have viewers for, uh, for everything. So, Bottom line, standardization is great for reusability, but by definition, it is a little bit restrictive. Um, so then, data analysis. I think there was already uh, a whole talk about GitHub and version control, yay, for the win. Uh, who is actively using version control for their work? Yeah, about half, That's, uh, it's not bad, it's not bad. Um, Let's see. So never again the manuscript version four final after comments final final uh, dot dog eggs. That's what the, the type of problem that you you would um, well uh, solve with using version control. GitHub is the online version, but it's just as good as just using Git itself, which is uh, pure version control, which you can just have locally on your. Um, on your, your desktop if you don't want to, to share things right away. Project Jupyter, did we talk about that already? Uh, okay, good, then I don't have to, to tell you about that. Python in the browser, also uh, openness by design, I love it. Uh, it's very nicely displayed by GitHub. GitHub is investing in, uh, well, I'm not sure if they're monetarily investing in, in Jupyter, but they're definitely making sure that uh, it is very easily displayed um, but uh, these things are just the, the generic tools. Um, oh, wait, what happened there? I Right, one of the things I wanted to show you, Brain Live. Does anybody know about that one yet? Yeah, some, some of you. Uh, so uh, I'm really excited about that project, and I'm, I would really like to see uh, if that takes off. Uh, let's see. Uh, it is a platform in which you can um, box up your analysis and put it online. And well, there is really quite a bunch of analyses. Um, it's got the code behind it. Um, and um, what it's even doing, uh, I'm not sure uh, how well, how easily it, it is to, to access it. I haven't tried it, but it is also executing uh, analyses uh, with cloud computing on some data sets. I'm not quite sure where you should put that data, um, but I do think it's pretty cool that uh, you can just have your analysis out there. If you made a brilliant new analysis, you can just put it on there and you can even see how many users have used it, how many times it was run. Uh, so I'm uh, really uh, curious to, to see, um, well, where that goes. 
Uh, right, that's brain life. The, yeah, I, I mentioned, I have to say, uh, th there is someone that at some point made uh, some tools for a graphical interface for reproducible analysis for workflow experiments, um, uh, which is uh, a terrible acronym for, for giraffe tools, uh, or which, which might be me, uh, as you might have guessed by now. Um, but my vision was that um, I would like to um, I would like users to be able to visually program their analysis and uh, to also be able to communicate their analysis very uh, graphically to one another. Because, let's face it, if you get a script of 300 lines of code, uh, you're not going to understand it straight away. And you're especially not going to understand the caveats. Uh, so instead, if you have that online... Oh, so, oh it's immediately going there. Oh wow, beautiful! Uh, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> had to do, had to say that. <laughs> anyway, um, but um, I was really going for this end-to-end -end analysis. Um, so what I did was um, I made my entire analysis pipeline for pre-processing uh, completely in the browser. Uh, so this is. Uh, this is using my own toolbox. You can also use Nightpipe. You can also add your own if you want. Um, it's not completely trivial to, to add your own, but you can. And it just says, right, uh, let's start with realigning functional scans and let's do something with design matrices or do something with FreeSurfer. And you've got a nice memo that tells you, oh, right, please run FreeSurfer first and link your folder here. Uh, and well, you can build your, your entire pipeline uh, whoop, and you can add new functions. And the idea is that it automatically creates the analysis code. And indeed, if you, uh, I could save the new version with this function on GitHub. Uh, I can check it out on GitHub and it automatically creates the code that um, uh, is, um, let's see, written right in a master script dot M, which is, uh, written in the readme, there is a uh, repository linked uh, with the data as well. So you can just completely take that data set, take that graphical representation, um, run the MATLAB script that it generates on the data, and poof, there you go, your end-to-end -end analysis. Um, the thing it does not provide, and that's still uh, the reason that it isn't used so often, um, it is very difficult to, uh, for people to um, completely use this when they're not familiar uh, with the, the actual procedures that they have to go through. Uh, very often when I'm coding as well, uh, I'm making a lot of mistakes. I want to uh, get quick feedback on what a single function does, uh, and that is not what this solution is providing. Um, so that's why it's very hard to, to market it to people. Um, at the same time, uh, what I did with this analysis, I coded it up first, and then I uh, recreated it in the, um, in the graphical user interface. And this is just an online link now that anybody can visit anywhere. Um, and because it's on GitHub, anybody can just fork the repository and start working on laminar analysis, laminar fMRI analysis. Uh, if you want to, please go ahead. And if you want to know more, uh, let me know. Uh, this is what I already said. Right. And what I think is very important is that it completely separates the conceptual code uh, from from the data that is eventually running through uh, the the data. Uh, sorry. The, the data that runs through the pipeline, uh, such that the code by design uh, is reusable for uh, data of a similar structure. Uh, it saves directly to GitHub. Well, I already mentioned that you should just, you know, poke me if I talk too long about this. So I'm going to uh, move on. It's a little bit experimental still, um, and it's very different from, from your, your standard approach. Um, so I can imagine that it's a little bit iffy, um, but, uh, yeah, oh, sorry. Um, but I'm going to move on for uh, with data visualization. Uh, sorry, how am I doing for time, by the way? I don't know how long I've got. Oh, that's brilliant. Oh, no, no, that's uh, the, 
That, that should be uh, brilliant. Um, data visualization, bioimage, sweet web, anybody familiar? No, nah, a little bit, a little bit. Some people went to OHBM. Uh, and so, um, one, uh, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm quite fond of open science. So at OHBM, I organized last year's open science room and to sort of promote my pet peeves a little bit, um, I, had, I hosted a session on web development, um, and one of the uh, things is uh, bioimage suite web uh, that was presented there. And it's a tool, let's see, uh, do not show this next time. And it's a tool in which you can very easily visualize data in the browser. Um, so uh, let's see, if we can load some standard files, yeah, load an MNI template, for example. Uh, is now loading something and well it is just a nifty viewer it is pretty equivalent to um just the nifty uh, viewer on your desktop uh, but it's in the browser you can also load your own data here uh, into the browser that doesn't mean that you're uploading it to anywhere it is still doing that locally or in web dev terms client side um and at the moment um well, it doesn't add a lot more than uh, than FSL view or MRI cron or whatever uh, you'd like to use, but um, it would be really cool if your data is stored somewhere in the cloud and then you can use this um, web viewer to, uh, to inspect your own uh, data or to have uh, your own data locally and compare it to an atlas that you're grabbing from the cloud. Uh, so I definitely see potential. At the moment, uh, I don't think it, it adds a lot more um, the, the, than, well, the current desktop tools. Um, automated fiber quantification. Anybody interested in DTI in general? Well, yeah, some, some. Uh, heard of this one or not? No, not really. No, uh, well, it was published in, I think, Nature Methods or something, pretty high up. Um, and it's it's a neat little tool. Um, it is uh, loading, but that's not what I was going to say. Yeah, there we go. Um, it is. Um, it allows you to upload many different subjects and view their, uh, well, their tractography uh, results and their, their bundle sizes. I know nothing about DTI, so maybe I, I'm talking rubbish now, but um, the idea is that you can visualize DTI results in some way that is probably quite meaningful, because otherwise I don't imagine they would have made the tool. Um, and it, it looks quite neat. I like it. Um, and, well, you can just, um, well, interactively uh, scroll through, through the brain um, Maybe it's useful. Anyway, I don't think, uh, maybe, so, well, uh, I saw some r hands raised about DTI. D does, there, does anything like this exist for the desktop as well? Meh. Not much response. Maybe, maybe it does. Anyway. Um, Explore DTI is a thing, right? What's that? Explore DTI. Explore DTI, I don't know. Uh, okay. Sounds cool. Sounds cool. Right, and then one of um, the pet projects, uh, uh, two years ago in Singapore, uh, at the hackathon uh, in uh, three days, uh, Dominic and Daniel uh, and me, we created uh, AR Medilla. Yeah, as you man might have noticed, uh, I'm sort of fond of, of animal acronyms. Um, so we created Augmented Reality we, but we never finished the acronym for Medillo. Uh, I still offer a beer for anybody that can finish the acronym. But the idea is that with a phone, you can, um, well, point it at a QR code, and then you've got um, a, um, well, a 3D image rotating brain with a statistical map. So if the, the use case for this would be um, the, uh, it's grabbing the statistical map from Open Neuro. So if you're at a conference and you want to show your statistical maps, but you don't want to show them in slices, instead you can paste your QR code uh, on there um, and people can just, with their QR code, go to the link straight away and just see the, the statistical map spinning around in 3D right in front of their eyes. It was just an, a neat project. Is it incredibly useful? 
meh, is it cool? I think so. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> anyway, um, data reporting, uh, that's the last one. So don't worry, I, I understand you get a bit bored of the, the list. Um, so uh, the, the, the generic ones, uh, aren't, I'm not going to go over those too much, but Zenodo is pretty cool for, uh, for registering links um, to, to code or presentations, bioarchive for publishing preprints. Uh, that's all discussion on itself, which we're not going to have uh, today. Uh, one of the things I, I do really like is uh, Git pitch. Anybody heard of Git pitch? No, never. Uh, Anybody heard of Markdown? Yeah, most of you. Oh, right. Um, Markdown is a very simple language um, to, to write, for example, readme files. Um, now, if you write a, um, a Markdown file in your GitHub repository and you call it pitchme.markdown, then automatically Git pitch will uh, create a presentation for it. At some point, I made a, a Donders template for it, so especially if you're from the Donders, uh, this might be useful. Uh, let me very quickly show you. Um, the pitchme.markdown um, just contains some, some markdown data. It's a very silly presentation, so please don't look at the content too much. Uh, although, people from the Donders might find it hilarious. Um, anyway, um, this is just a browser-based uh, presentation that allows you to, uh, well, go up and down and to the next and to whatever. Um, at some point, I wrote a, a grant proposal for forks here in the kitchen because all the forks disappeared. So um, this was a, uh, a very silly project about that. But the point is, the only thing you need is a single markdown file in your GitHub a repository, and it's very easy to uh, to make a presentation about that very Git repository, and it's all version controlled. Um, so let's move on. Um, is Remy here? I don't think so. I, I think he's hacking. Uh, but um, ah, but but maybe some of you contributed to this because he, he's got uh, he's very good at including people uh, in his project. Um, the Kobidas checklist. Have you heard of Kobidas before? He, oh wow, was that? He's working, right now. he's working on it right now. Brilliant. I expected something like that. <laughs> so uh, the, I, I won't start pre presenting his work then. Um, but uh, I still want to to. Uh, attribute some sentences to him. It's a checklist uh, for uh, MRI studies of what you need to report uh, when you're writing a paper on MRI uh, data analysis. Uh, it all started uh, this year, sorry, it's January already, last year in Rome, um, and he got a whole bunch of people interested. Uh, important to note, uh, Remy had never done web development in his life before, um, but um, if you got the good crowd, uh, then it's very easy to just get started uh, with something like a checklist uh, in web dev, even if you don't know it. Um, I, I'm going to be honest about this. Uh, a serious web dev project is uh, requiring serious time investment. That's also what Remy will tell you, probably. Um, but setting up the scaffold uh, can be pretty valuable to, uh, to people and can be pretty well, empowering in general. Um, so, so that was a little list of, uh, well, category-wise, what tools you could use. So now the question is, can I do an end-to-end -end neuroimaging analysis on the web? Well, um, we just covered data collection, sharing, analysis, visualization, and reporting. And can these things be done on the web? Well, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, some of them. Uh, tools exist for each stage, but they aren't always integrated. Uh, that is what I see as the next challenge uh, for, for the coming five years. Uh, they're trying, so Russ Poldrak from Open Neuro and um, the Franco Pastili group from the, the Brain Life with the uh, analyses, they're trying to, to connect the two platforms so that you've got your analysis on Brain Life and the, the output result uh, is there on Open Neuro. Uh, I really hope that the visualization 
uh, tools are also connected uh, at some point to open neuro or other um, similar um, the uh, repositories. Robert, can you tell me uh, the Donders uh, uh, data repositories? Is there any plan of connecting that to Nifty viewers or anything like that? Just viewers in general? No? No? No. no? Ah, no. We already discussed over lunch that we have this tricky situation with GDPR, yep. and, and most of the data that is potentially identifiable in the Donald's repository is behind a, a data use agreement that you first have to agree to, so like, so that, which is a complicating factor in making the, the data easily accessible in, uh, in, in web platforms. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, very often web, develop, web platforms themselves have their own well, hosted server, uh, and the Donders doesn't want to send data there. Uh, I think that's a problem. At least that's part of the problem, right? Um, so, so this is a challenge. Uh, I hope it's going to be solved. I'm not sure how. So, um, I already mentioned a couple of times. It is difficult, but I do think uh, it is possible because. Um, oh, sorry, now I wanted to talk about the next one. You're right. Um, most of these solutions, uh, with some ex exceptions, are only a couple of years old. Uh, so this is really an, an emergent field. Cloud computing, uh, in general, is an emergent field. Uh, I think the future is that uh, we don't have big servers here in a room, uh, but we're just using Google's or Amazon's or Microsoft's uh, servers. Uh, I think the many HCP analyses are already done in the cloud. Uh, Open Neuro definitely stores uh, their data with Amazon, um, but th there are uh, a lot of challenges there, there still. Um, but you can still uh, right. So the the fact that most of this is, is less than five years old, so it means that uh, if you look around and you, you look at some postdocs, when they started their PhDs, nothing of these uh, existed. Uh, so things are moving quite fast. So that also means that if you start now, you can still be ahead of the curve, uh, either in, in development or in uh, just using them and showing that you, know, you care about open science um, and about the, the problems that it can solve. Um, right, I already mentioned that it is still sort of expensive, um, but most of you don't have to deal with that on a regular basis. Um, so, um, is web the future? I'm not sure how am I doing for time, but I think I'm sort of in discussion time. Ah, oh, brilliant. Okay. Um, so again, you know, um, I would like to have a, a little bit of discussion. I would. Um, so initially, when I was preparing this presentation, I was like, oh, I would really like to give you some handles of where to start uh, if you would actually want to uh, create some project like the one I wrote or like the one that Remy wrote. Um, but I realized that requires a completely different presentation. So um, if you would like to go into that in the discussion, then please ask away. Uh, but that's why I kept it out of the presentation. Uh, with that, I'm quickly moving to, to the next part. And thank you very much for your attention and for the invitation. Any questions? Oh, come on, come on. No, yeah, please. Thank you. <laughs> I forgot in the previous session. Thank you very much for a very nice uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, don't you think uh, if we all go put our stuff, our research, into the cloud, uh, that we hand over too much to those big companies like uh, uh, Amazon and... Uh, yeah, the, the, the big evil corporate companies. Uh, I don't really share that fear. So at the moment, um, I believe um, we sort of have an obligation to, to share it with society in general. And if society, well, if Google is part of society uh, and they can do useful stuff with it, I think that is important. So they, uh, to some extent, they, uh, they have a right uh, 
to the data, I feel. Mm -hmm. I do recognize that they could do evil stuff as well, like identifying people, because, well, a brain uh, is as unique as a fingerprint, right? Uh, so identifying people is possible, and uh, I'm sure that uh, there are insurance companies that are very interested in it. Um, I think these are the, uh, the problems in general that we should be very mindful about. Um, I do think that in principle, we should focus on, on sharing, especially the knowledge, uh, and the knowledge even more than the data itself. I hope that's sort of the middle ground answer to your question. Robert. So, so can, I, can I ask the same question, but from a slightly different angle? Yes, by all means. So, so <laughs> yes, yesterday during drinks, I had a, had a very interesting discussion uh, that was not so much on, on big tech companies, but more on Elsevier. Don't, are, are you not afraid that Amazon is going to become the next Elsevier? Um, could you tell me why that's something we should be afraid of? I'm, so I'm, ref I'm, I'm referring to a discussion that we've had yeah. uh, on Tuesday afternoon, a presentation. Elsevier being uh, like a very strong uh, player in, the, in, in our publishing trajectory and Elsevier imposing very large fees first on reading the paper and nowadays also on publishing the paper, which I personally don't see so much as a problem, but I know that some of the audience actually do see this as a as a problem, and of course there's a lot of discussion whether a commercial company such as Elsevier sh should play such a role, big role in us publishing our research findings, even if it's open access because it's still mm -hmm. expensive. And, that, and that's also where I... I but are, are you talking about the money? Uh, the fact that, it is, it, that at some point it becomes a requirement to share your data and only uh, Amazon uh, uh, well, requires a fee it's, or doing... It's, it's, not, it's not a requirement to publish in Elsevier, but if mm -hmm. you want to have a good scientific career, publishing in NeuroImage or publishing in other uh, journals which are controlled by publisher, commercial publishers definitely helps. So how would that mm -hmm. be for data in the future? Are we like technically allowed to publish data on open free platforms, but for career perspectives that we would rather have to publish it in the big tech-owned cloud, such as Google, Amazon, uh, or Azure, like we've, so because we've, we've seen quite some of these cloud solutions being mentioned from these. Yeah, uh, yeah, please, please, I think you've got something to add. Sorry, please, I, I can't hear you, so please use the microphone. Yeah. And the question is about the digital divide it creates. A digital divide. It's like so when Google was creating, like Google and Facebook, they were trying to put the free basics. It's like mm -hmm. they will give free internet, but access to only f few sites. Yeah. It's something, but it will, it will uh, like create an inequality in the digital divide. Like they will give some advantages to them. So I recognize that there are dangers that um, Elsevier to some extent, but also science and nature, uh, they've got um, some scientists in a stranglehold that they uh, are sort of career-wise forced to, to publish there. Um, something could happen like that with data. At some point, uh, I suppose, uh, N is it science that has the, the data repositories or nature? Nature, uh, nature, nature, uh, nature data repositories. At some point, um, maybe nature data reports, uh, data repositories are so cool uh, that it would advance your career. I think um, that could at some point, well, basically turn evil, have a, a negative uh, impact. I also think that before that uh, moment is ever reached, um, a lot of people um, have shared their data, which I think is very beneficial to the community. So are they going to extort some money here and there? Probably. Do I think it also delivers value to uh, the scientific community? Yes. The balance, we'll see about that, is my answer. <laughs> Uh, Tim, uh, I, I had to ask this question. So, what is your attitude towards uh, efforts to decentralize the internet on blockchains, using blockchains? <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't. Blockchain. Uh, couldn't resist asking this question. Yes. So, why? Well, well, um, I think um, the question is ill posed in the sense that um, blockchain it might be a solution, but you still have to 
provide a problem to which it is a solution. And at the moment, I don't see what the problem is, uh, especially not in this context of neuroimaging on the web, that blockchain solves. Well, in this case, uh, I meant um, efforts to, to create decentralized uh, databases using, you know, so that you're a node in the network and you can provide with your own, uh, like, uh, um, capacity to store information. And right. In that uh, in that sense, that could be a potential replacement for for Google or Amazon services that we have these days. So so there are efforts. Uh, I mean, I'm actually not that I mean not that interested in that um, aspect of <laughs> blockchain uh, development. But um, but I know that there is a lot of development in that direction already. I, I, I'm sure there is, and it sounds cool, but I know nothing about it. I'm sure, uh, uh, well, no, uh, let me put it differently. I welcome the next, um, well, the next Google or Facebook in the blockchain space that actually provides value. At the moment, uh, and I don't want to make this about blockchain at all, uh, but at the moment I haven't seen, um, well, blockchain projects that really provide, um, uh, well, answers to existing problems. More questions? Or maybe the last, <laughs> last question? No. Please, uh, there. Besides all these concerns, uh, on a positive note, how did you start web development? Besides Good question. Um, so I started with uh, well, desktop development, uh, and I wrote this program called Porcupine, which is the precursor of the, the giraffe tools, and um, it was actually Anisha that uh, mentioned in her review of the Porcupine paper that um, she w uh, was like, why is this a desktop and not a web application? And at that point, it was already something in my mind, uh, and I was like, all right, let's indeed rewrite my desktop application as a web application. So I had a very clear project um, for which I already had the basis. Um, and then I just started using, uh, I started taking some Coursera online, so on some web dev course. Uh, and it, uh, I got to mention, I've got some, some technical background. Uh, I didn't roll into a PG for, from psychology. So I, um, I already had, uh, the programming skills, and for me, it was just a different dialect of, of programming language. So it was relatively easy uh, to, to rewrite the thing, and that's sort of how I got interested. And I suppose that got reinforced by the, um, well, the open science problems that it solves. So that's why I kept being interested and just learning more, but mostly of it is self-taught. Is that... Thanks, Tim. Cool. Thank you. So we are going to back now. Uh, thanks again for your talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.